Hi, hello. Thank you for joining us at the sixth edition of Expo Chicago, the International Exposition of Modern and Contemporary Art. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to Dialogues, presented in partnership with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Dialogues offers panel discussions, conversations, and prov provocative artistic discourse with leading artists, curators, designers, and art professionals on current issues that engage them. I am honored to welcome Stephanie Cristello, Director of Programming at Expo Chicago and Editor-in-Chief of The Scene, as the moderator of this panel, Visibility, Invisibility, Sculpture in Everyday Space. <coughs> Stephanie Cristello is also responsible for organizing the remarkable programs held here at Expo Chicago. Please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, and thank you all for joining. Um, we're really excited to be hosting this conversation with Tom Burr and Nina Beyer, and thank you both for traveling to be here as well. Um, I wanted to start with a bit of the panel brief and give a context to what we'll be discussing today. Um, the title of the talk is Visibility, Invisibility, Sculpture in Everyday Space. Um, but the real thrust behind this panel was um, a question that was uh, generated through not only looking at Tom and Nina's work, but a few other contemporary examples, which is what is the responsibility of formalism in the 21st century, um, which seemed like a really relevant topic for a sculptural practice today. Uh, so this panel will be tracing the work of Nina and Tom, whose diverse sculptural practices are inflected, transformed, um, or impacted by their environment, from public space, galleries, to institutions tracing the implications of visibility and in invisibility from work that both adopts and appropriates existing materials, we're going to address the poetic and political consequences of how works appear or disappear within a given context um, through the lens of object making specifically. So the way that we're going to structure this is Tom and Nina will both present a little bit about their work. Um, but before they do that, I just wanted to give a bit of a background to their exhibition history and, and sort of the, the exhibitions that have brought him, them here today. So Nina Beyer, we'll start with you, um, is a Denmark-born and Berlin-based artist who's held solo exhibitions at the Kunstferen in Hamburg, the David Robert Arts Foundation in London, um, the Nottingham Contemporary in the UK, Kunstlala Charlottenburg in Copenhagen, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, the list goes on. Um, she's represented by Jose Garcia in Mexico City, as well as Standard Oslo in Norway. And, um, you know, that was really one of the, the primary ways that I saw her work was from an exhibition that you all did in, in 2013. Um, so that is Nina. And Tom Burr, just to give a brief bio for him as well, lives and works in New York and graduated from the School of Visual Arts with educational experience as a critic in sculpture at Yale University a scholar at the Whitney Independent Study Program in New York, as well as an artist in residence at the Edinburgh College of Art in Scotland. His extensive list of international solo exhibitions includes museums and galleries such as the Whitney, the Green Naftali Gallery in New York, Sculpture Center, Bordolami, um, the project that he's doing in New Haven through Bordolami, um, and many others, Gallery Neue in Berlin, etc. Um, he is represented by um, Stefania Bordolami in New York, and that is Tom. Um, and I've seen your work many times, not only through our in situ curator, Flora Osteria, but um, many publications as well. So I wanted to open to our panelists um, to briefly present. Hello. <laughs> That's here. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it works. Um, so to, we selected some different works that relate to the topic of today, and um, to those of you who are not so familiar maybe with my work, I'll try to explain a few of the pieces so we have some basis to talk from. Um, my work, I keep, I, I keep on returning to an obsession with uh, value, how it's defined, like what, what is valuable to us as human beings and how it's defined, negotiated, traded, and how every object or uh, any kind of behavior in a sense becomes a container of this history 
um, another recurrent thing that goes on in my work is this um, an interest in how the image relates to these um, ideas of value and how the object and the image somehow uh, responds to each other or, or gives birth to each other. Here behind me is a, a picture from last year I started doing shows in show homes. So these model apartments that are made by real estate developers when creating uh, um, domestic housing. It's a tradition. It's, it's rarer and rarer that they, this takes place. but. Um, where they basically, before finishing the building, create one apartment within a building block that's completely finished and, and where an interior de decorator makes kind of an image of a home um, that you, could, you can visit. Um, and this one was in Mexico City. It was a complete, just like a concrete structure and cement splatter everywhere. And then you would walk through and open a door and behind there would be this tiny apartment with like super manicured uh, scenario. And I placed my work um, kind of interweave with the decor that was already there. There's a lot of like um, stand-ins for artworks in these types of settings. So I would exchange some of them and leave some behind, so it was one, one kind of submerged setting. Um, in this picture you see this a piece from 2011, Tragedy, where a professional actor dog is asked to play dead on a Persian rug. So for a minute uh, the dog lies completely still and, and um, performs its own end unknowingly, and then it gets up and bit like a magic spell, the, the moment is over. And behind, over the bed, you see uh, these pieces where I framed wigs of real hair. Um, I think the show home apartment, the dog and the wigs, this, this relationship that they all share, this, this kind of both being what they are and an image or a representation of themselves at the same time. So. For example, the wigs are real hair, but they're also a representation of hair at the same time. And I got interested in this space where this frozen moment, um, so the property of hair being that it grows and these being stuck in the same uh, hairstyle forever. Um, kind of like this show home being just being a representation of a home. So I placed my work in different spots around. Um, I won't go into every single one of them. Here's another show where I also showed the dog piece in London in a high-end luxury show home that ICA staged last year. And um, I would do different works, so both performative works, sculptural, but also smaller kind of intervention works that were more relating to the, the format of this stage department. So here is a bunch of virgin white cotton underwear stuck in the different voids. Um, okay, back to the art space. Um, Here's a piece that we talked about in relationship to your brief. Um, it's called Real Estate, also relating to the previous lecture. Um, and it's a bunch of headrests, both from cars, office chairs, massage chairs, um, anchored into stone. So the display structure is like a support structure. It's the weight of the stone is uh, decided in relationship to how much resistance the headrest would have in order to withstand um, someone leaning on it. Um, here you see the wigs on the wall, but um, another work that deals with this kind of display structure again. Um, these seeds are called coco de mer, they're like the largest seed on the planet. They only grow in the Seychelles Islands and they're now threatened to become extinct because people have been collecting them forever. Um, I mean, I got fascinated with these seeds for several reasons. One was, of course, like the idea of a palm tree making a female nude. But um, 
also, again, somehow this object which projects the image of fertility and that image becomes the very reason that it will never come to fruition. Um, so these, I like these barren wombs. They're like empty, have been, yeah, um, completely de-fertilized. I don't know how you say that. Um, another piece of recent show was Standard, Standard Oslo. Um, these are remote control cars and they're transporting the human hair. So f I tend to use the same objects in different configurations. And here they were moving around the space um, by these small transporters. Uh, in between these structures of burnt bread. Um, and the bread basically came from, so I've been trying to petrify things for a long time. I've, I wanted to transition things into um, sculptures, and that has not worked. Um, apparently, Google says it is possible, but I have not succeeded so far. So then I moved into burning things, so the transition of an organic material into um, a more durable one. Anyway, I've just got a wave. I'll finish. Um, here, so this this kind of like borrowing the logics of how things work in the real world. Bread burns. Uh, rugs are being traded in piles. Um, I I have, I like to pick up on these things. And um, this piece, everything is borrowed. So the rugs were borrowed from a carpet dealer. The female nudes were borrowed from the museum. And between them, you see this kind of like the logic of, of like paperweight. The, the sculptures are holding down cash that I borrowed from friends. Um, yeah, I shall maybe just pass that on. <laughs> Hello. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I guess um, issue of formalism um, in relationship to my work. I mean, formalism, of course, is something that uh, concerns me. Um, and I think that, you know, the, I, as I recall, that the slides that I'm choosing to, to show today um, might depict how my work has, over considerable time, um, oscillated maybe, uh, consciously oscillated between some sort of pure formalism or some sort of not to, to pure formalism, and then something that might be its other, that might have to do with excess or um, um, some sort of articulateness or some sort of uh, discursiveness. Um, this is a work that I did in, um, that I made in 2000 called Deep Purple that um, appropriated an existing sculptor, sculpture by uh, another artist, um, uh, Richard Sara, uh, Tilted Arc, his work from the 1980s, from 1980. Um, uh, which had a, a, an incredible uh, controversy surrounding it regarding its dismantlement and coming down from Federal Plaza in New York. And I wanted to sort of appropriate that legacy um, in another form. And so I made this sort of uh, three-quarters scale copy or shadow or impersonation of, um, of his work. Uh, and, and relative to these issues of visibility, invisibility, and sight, uh, this is a work that very um, emphatically was nomadic, uh, was able to kind of activate different sites that it was in. Here you see it in its sort of last, one of its last incarnations in France, um, but it was at several different locations before that and very stubbornly was not um, the kind of site specificity that Sarah was talking about in his work. Um, I'm jumping around quite a bit. Um, also apropos to the notion of formalism, I've also works later, um, uh, sort of interested in the space of painting, the space of uh, abstraction, the space of monochromes, and, and, and want to sort of, again, slip in and out of this notion of something that might be very blank on the one hand, and then might be um, otherwise discursive. Similarly, you know, I, I, there, there might be quite a space between the last image that I showed, which were these quote unquote blanket works that I did for, for quite a while, and a work like this, which is called Susan Blushing. Um, it says Blushing Susan there, but it's actually Susan Blushing. Um, and 
taking the same sort of materiality, the blankets, et cetera, but doing something quite different uh, and, and, and proposing the notion of, of a kind of theatrical stage set. In this instance, um, the work, the Susan, um, uh, is Susan uh, Sontag. Um, that's Susan Sontag on the Vanity Fair um, magazines there. And I was thinking very much about presence and celebrity and, and um, iconography, but also this notion of emotion and, or the emotive. Uh, relative to, to a static uh, work of art. And Susan Sontag uh, seemed to me always to be depicted in the notion of black and white, right? And I was very interested in this notion of the flushed and the, and the, and the blush and this kind of emotive quality. Um, a more recent work um, called No Access. Um, in a sculpture park in Cologne, there were actually 26 of these units, uh, one for every letter of the alphabet. And they came out of my thinking about, again, formalism in relationship to the notion of audience, the notion of access and no access. This sort of highly polished steel, in fact, it's not mirror. And I was thinking very much about uh, 18th century, 19th century artifice in relationship to something called the black glass, which was a small black um, shiny object, sometimes polished stone, sometimes actual glass that, that first landscape painters would use to sort of to, to frame and to, uh, to throw a landscape into, into frame behind them. Um, and then it was taken up as a sort of popular touristic thing to do. But then, of course, it becomes very interesting in relative to our own day, where people are walking around with you know, small black shiny objects, sort of mediating their environments as well. Also frames the audience that looks at it very, very clearly. And this was the, this was the project. Uh, that was referred to at the beginning of the talk that I've done in, uh, for the past year in New Haven, Connecticut, um, where I was born. Um, and I had the opportunity through my gallery and through a program of my gallery to, to, to rent this space, a Marcel Breuer building that was empty, vacated, building, built in 1969 for Armstrong Tire Company, Armstrong Rubber Company, rather. And now is uh, abandoned but owned by IKEA Corporation um, in New Haven. And so there's this sort of empty formal object there, this building that I could talk about endlessly. I won't. Um, but inside it, I, 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 on the first floor, I, I created a series of um, sculptures, gestures, um, uh, sort of interventions, I guess some might say, that, uh, that tried to sort of tweak out the building's relationship built in the 60s to my relationship built in the 60s, both have been sort of geographically concurrent in, in, this, in New Haven, but then bringing other uh, figures into it, such as um, Jean Genet, uh, who, had a, who had a presence in New Haven. Um, the young Jean Genet on the left, an older Jean Genet on the right. These areas that are cordoned off, part of the project had to do with restrictions um, and codes that had to be met uh, by New Haven building inspectors. Um, railings I had to build as well. They got further articulated. Jean Genet's speech, the Black Panther speech, was May Day speech was inscribed on the top of that. Another recent work in Munster, also dealing with this notion of perhaps formalism as a form, kind of container for content. Another recent work in collaboration with Cosmo Van Bonin, perhaps again dealing with this notion of legacies of minimalism in relationship to some sort of other social or political ramifications. And there you go. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you both for, for that background. I think it helps give a great context for um, some of the things that I want to ask you about now. Um, so I wanted to start first with the role of aesthetics in each of your practices. and. Both of you touched on this in relationship to your own practice, what we can sort of call this, this formalism, uh, meaning the purely visual function of the work. Um, but how do you think, how do you define how the work appears, which I think for both of you is sort of this austere, minimal, or utilitarian aesthetic versus what the work communicates? And Tom, you mentioned the word emotive, and Nina, I'm interested and sort of the humor um, element of your practice, too. How do you see uh, the role of formalism unfolding in, in that communication on a practical level in terms of your approach? Maybe, Tom, you want to start with that emotion. Um, yeah. So 
I guess, you know, I guess I could start from my reaction to um, that, the comment of, of a phrase like merely formal. Um, because I'm, I'm interested in how loaded all objects are, all gestures are, all architecture is. There is no purely or merely formal in a certain sense. Right. So I'm interested in trying to sort of upend things, trying to, trying to tease things out, trying to, 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 to acknowledge the, 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 the factors and the, and, the, and the conditions that create various forms, whether that be you know, um, a painting or a, a, an architectural setting or a gallery or a museum. Nina, do you agree in terms of the purely formal object being a myth? Yes, it was funny because when you sent me the, your ideas for this discussion, I was kind of surprised to be asked to talk about the formal aspects of my work because I feel like I always find myself in a place of talking about the other side of it, like as if the formal thing is a, a secondary to the content that's uh, carried by these objects. And of course, I have a, I have a huge focus myself on on objects as carriers of meaning. So, so the idea of actually trying to look at the process that comes, and in my case, usually comes second, um, is, is quite interesting to, to pick this apart. Because for me, I think I get interested in, in something, and then I start working with it and chewing on it. And then at some point, some form comes out of it. And, and I realized that the form is the one thing that I can manipulate. Like all that shit, that the, the stuff, all this history that any material that you attack is carrying, you, you just, it just comes along as these components, as this, and then you can create this dialogue by messing with the form somehow. Um, and I actually really enjoy that part of the process of making a new thing out of something existing of like right and in terms of the exercise too I think that that's why both of your work really um, is in dialogue in this way in that it it sort of levels on this the appearance of the contemporary I guess if we can call it that but approaching it from two very different angles and Tom you coming through formalism into ideas out of you know diverging from the idea that there is this purely formal object that might exist and you know, from the concept then forming what ends up turning into a formal object that can, that can communicate, so um, in terms of that level. Um, and I also wanted to touch on the sort of the sites, the various different sites that you all were talking about, um, from the gallery to the institution to some of these more site-specific projects. And maybe a nice place to start is how have you selected some of the sites for your recent work and what was the the ideas behind those locations? Right. Well, you know, my I guess my work um, uh, comes out of of, uh, of a lot of um, legacies of site specificity. Right. Mm -hmm. This is something that that I always thought about. This is something that I was educated in. This is a, this was very much in the air when I was going to school and and first practicing or first exhibiting, first making work. Um, but I was always interested in that as something that needed to be questioned as well, and that sites were not neutral sites, uh, that sites were loaded sites, the same issues that we're dealing with with formalism. Um, so I'm always extremely uh, in my comfort when um, uh, sites are um, chosen for me. Um, I'm not particularly comfortable um, uh, choosing locations for myself. I think that I, I consider locations to be part of the conditions that I'm working with and whether that be the classic sort of white cube gallery or, um, you know, and this obvious exception would be in a certain way this Breuer building in New Haven where I in fact did choose it, but that was sort of a, that was based on a certain grid of conditions of where I was born. I set up a sort of problem that I had to then be sort of confined within and this building made sense for that. Mm -hmm. But given, you know, this expanse of possibilities, you know, uh, of where would one want to show, there, it, there is no ideal situation for me. I like to work within the parameters of a given s structure, I like discipline. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, I definitely recognize that. I, I also, so I started sh this, um, I had this idea of showing my work within the show home, mm -hmm. uh, as an alternative space that's also a display space like the gallery and mm -hmm. definitely came from the 
like a certain frustration with this, these spaces that always look more or less the same and I needed something to react to and maybe also something to that would challenge the work so so um, for example placing work within the structure of this kind of like a artificial home just really made the work look very bad and and doing that as a test to to what I produce and the motivations for how I produce was was very good for me to see to see my work in a not ideal uh, framework and and to put it side by side with things that looked like art but wasn't um, it, was, it was a nice it was a nice way to challenge so I feel like that's the that's the thing you learn you learn about your work every time you see it in a new context whether it's an art fair or um, mm -hmm. Building. Some, something you just said, Nina, is actually very interesting to me as well, because I think that there are very different ways one can approach art making. And I think that this notion of reacting to a space is very interesting to me and something that is a kind of precondition for my own uh, set of ideas in a way. And I think that even though this may uh, seem a little bit uh, laborious as a word, but I think it's in some ways born out of some notion of critique and, and having some sort of a questioning critical practice um, rather than this sort of uh, neutral idea that, 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 that ideas just are sort of born out of, sort of some sort of basic creative ingenuity. Um, I think that there's, there's an object one wants to work on in a certain way, and, and it's about the, uh, using the role of, of, of the artist as possibly uh, thinking about critiquing, examining the conditions that we find ourselves in. Uh, that seems to me the most sort of exciting possibility of, of what one can do, and that, that seems to me what you're saying in a certain level in terms of reacting against a space in a certain way as a, as a kind of given, given condition, as a ready-made condition in our lives in a certain way. Yeah, and with that notion of sight as well, and, and doing some research for this panel, thinking about the, the term everyday space, um, I was thinking with both of your work in terms of um, the heterotopia, which comes from Foucault's text on the utopia and the heterotopia. Uh, the utopia being this unreal space and the heterotopia being this space that can be, um, you know, contested, represented, and then inverted. And I think both of your works sort of function in this realm where you're working with an object or an environment that is in some ways representative of that environment and in some ways is subversive of it at the same time. Um, you know, he uses metaphors such as the mirror as a location or the cemetery, but I think it could just as easily define to the abandoned industrial space or these show homes in real estate. Can you see your work um, relating in some way to this metaphor as a heterotopia in its own way? <laughs> <laughs> kind of a loaded yeah, question. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a that's a big one. I I guess like this, this kind of unsettled space, this this kind of constant shifting that I feel like happens in your work and and that I'm trying to to chase as well, where you, it's never really resting on one foot or the other. Is something that especially when I see your. Your installation in the Briar Building. This, this, this. Like you're working so much with the building, but your your objects are also just uh, not fitting in. Like the the fact that you're doing the rails is something that is almost invisible in one sense because we've learned to screen a room and look beyond these objects, and right. and then at the same time, that's the sculptural presence that you you leave behind that. You know, I because I, I, I'm you know I think very much about Foucault, <laughs> yeah. um, or have in my life, and um, this notion of heterotopias is, is, is interestingly in relationship to this the Marcel Breuer building. One of the things, okay, there's the building itself, and there's that as a site, right? But then within it, one of the things that I was required to do, where you saw that sort of red tiles with those white sort of Solowitian railings, um, was to surround uh, because of the lip that would, people would trip on to sort of cordon off those areas. And those areas that I had to cordon off all happened to be the former uh, restrooms and bathrooms and washrooms of the building, which 
I've thought about in certain ways as sort of a classic sort of heterotopia, the sort of in between, neither here nor there, uh, this kind of in transit sort of space, this, this sort of thing, like like the mobile home, like these kind of things that are not permanently, um, um, like, I, doesn't Foucault even use like the ship as a sort of classic example that's on its way somewhere, right. that's in between, that's traveling, which is kind of, I think very, very active in terms of any kinds of exhibition spaces, thinking about ex exhibition spaces mm -hmm. as, as sort of heterotopias. Yeah, and maybe we can touch on the, the performative elements of both of your work as well. Um, Nina, I know that we, when we were speaking over the phone before this panel, and you, you mentioned with the headrest works, that the work functions in the logic of the sculpture, but not necessarily in the logic of what it becomes, and what you were speaking about was, you know, people laying their head, the idea that they could lay their head, and that's the weight that defines the, the stone on the bottom. And so this performative suggestion is somehow present in the final sculpture itself, um, but is maybe not always performed in the gallery for different reasons and in terms of how we're sort of taught to interact with the work. Um, so I'm wondering if you can both talk about performance, and I know, Tom, you have quite a few programs coming up at the New Haven space that are perhaps more performative in nature. Um, what's the role of the performance in your work? I think for me, this is very blurry what, which works end up being performative and which ones are not. It's, it's always, always the dog the performer. The dog is a performer, <laughs> but it's also a sculpture. So that's, that's the thing, the moment the dog plays dead, it turns into this sculpture or representation of itself. And I'm always, the other piece that was visible in one of the show home pictures was um, the sculpture which is based on an online delivery scheme, so signing up the space to this vegetable delivery scheme and then constantly replenishing this kind of image of the cornucopia every time one of the, these vegetables get wrinkly, a new one will be arriving and replacing the previous one. So maintaining this kind of fresh image for the entire duration of the show. And just, just um, yeah, I don't know whether that's a sculpture or an image or a performance. It's, it's Is like, one more um, alive than the other? That's, <laughs> that's a question of definition. You know, um, I, 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 I'm very sympathetic to this notion of these, that these are and perhaps should be blurred lines um, because something, uh, Nina, you said at the beginning about dealing with value, et cetera, in your work, already the, 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 there's, these, are, these are objects that don't, I mean, I think something that perhaps we share in common is that we're not interested in an isolated autonomous object. Uh, that, right. that, that there is always, and you can call this perform a performative, gesture, but there, there's a network of, of participants, <laughs> um, and audience is one of them. And, and that already starts to throw into, in, into question the notion of a static object relative to a, to a, a network. Or, um, and, and I think that's a kind of performative way of or thinking about objects in a performative sense. Of course, then there are moments that might seem more classically performance, um, or one might do a, a performance. but. I think in my work, that's only to ever underscore the notion that all of these things are kind of dynamic, dialectical, performative sort of, sorts of things. And what are some of the activations that, that you've been doing with the Breuer House specifically? Um, well, you know, um, I had these sort of grandiose ideas that there was going to be a lot of sort of kind of programming um, originally in this space. But the, the space I took for a year, honestly, the, the, very, the, the first almost half of a year was taken up with the performative elements of dealing with the codes of the city of New Haven. Right. And so, and then I sort of incorporated those into that. So that, and I, I, all of those conditions, all of those restrictions, all of those problems that were required to get a temporary CFO in order to have a public in that building became the content. Um, so now there, there will be in November a more classical performance, which will be a spoken word performance with myself and others that are kind of taking on the building as, as sort of positions um, in the space. So that will, I, further activate and maybe underscore that notion of, of, of a space as performative. Right. Well, great. Um, I think that covers you know, a lot of the, the projects that we set out to do. So I wanted to open up um, to Q&A from the audience if anybody had any questions for Tom and Nina. Do we have any? <laughs> 
We can't see any of you, by the way. Right, yeah. <laughs> well, if there are no questions, um, thank you both so much. Do you guys thank have you. any questions for us, me, anyone? I don't think so. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you both. You. Thank you, everyone, for coming.